Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to, to this event. And I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to see so many people here. Um, of course, at this New Year point, it's a time of reflection after our refreshments, and what better way to start the, the year than to have the chance to reflect on uh, learning and teaching through the, the lecture. For you and for me, uh, learning and teaching, of course, is at the very heart of what it is to be a university. This is really the core function and activity that brings us to this place. And, um, of course, I think for you and certainly for me, um, when I was involved directly in learning and teaching every day, of course, it's what brings us that personal satisfaction, that personal confidence of knowing that we're here because we want to impart our knowledge. We're here because we want to interact with other students. We're here because we want to work with other colleagues to do a really good job in transferring knowledge and seeing uh, uh, students learn and develop. That's what inspires us to be in a university. So that's at the heart of every university, and that's why we're, we're here. And it's fantastic that we have a learning and teaching academy uh, which is focused on helping us support us to fulfill our aspirations that we all have in this room to be inspiring members of staff, inspiring educators. And um, thank you also that we've got Sheila with us here today, who's been here since 7 a.m. doing things, um, who is going to present, of course, this inspiring New Year uh, lecture. So, uh, and Martha's going to introduce her in, in a moment or two. Uh, I also like to say a word of welcome because I, I, I know from discussions with Martha we've got our new advanced HE senior and principal fellow cohort who've been uh, dashing across here from having your first um, fellowship retreat day. Is that right, Martha? Yeah. So welcome to you. And I wish all members of that cohort uh, a very special time as you go through uh, this period. And indeed, please invite me to meet you uh, later on so that uh, I'd be interested to hear what you've learned and what your reflections are on that experience. I'd be really interested to, to connect with you on that. Now, uh, I think we all uh, know that one of the principal objectives of the Harry Watt University and our strategy is to be an organisation, a university that is a, already a special university, but a university in which our staff and our students feel that we are absolutely flourishing, a place where we as staff can excel in our own profession and feel proud of what we're doing and of each other in helping to be part of a professional team in, in the way that we work together in teaching. And uh, people say, what, what is it, Richard, you regard as being, uh, having a flourishing, you know, flourishing community? And, and for me, it's, of course, about being, feeling that I am and you are utterly successful in our careers, utterly successful in our passion to uh, teach, utterly successful in our passion to research. And for our students, we want them to be utterly successful in their academic life and actually in their personal disposition and in their personal lives. You know, that's our, that's our spirit of flourishing. And this is only going to happen if we as a community are switched on as a group, if we as a community are working together with each other, if we're talking to each other, if we're working with one another, if we're actually trying to build a very positive educational environment. And that's what I feel we have at Heritage Watt, and that's what I feel we can build on even more strongly particularly through the Learning and Teaching Academy. We're going to create, because we choose to, we're going to create a very positive educational environment for ourselves and therefore for our students as well. But it begins with, with us. And that's what excites me about the Learning and Teaching Academy and our future positioning of the importance of learning and teaching as a core part of our strategy and our success going forward. It's all about 
actually our education infrastructure, which is us, the people. That's what excites me. That's what's going to make the difference. And, of course, in our strategy going forward, we're also wanting to explore some of the new frontiers of how we best deploy digital education. Um, Sheila, as you may know, um, 25, 26, or was it 27 years ago, our business school here was leading and pushing the frontiers in enabling people to learn uh, remotely through the, the, the use of materials that were provided uh, initially in terms of big books that were posted out, and more latterly, uh, and, and for the future, in providing online resource. And we as a university want to see how we can best utilize the tools and the resources of the digital world and combine it with the real physical world to provide ways of learning that will help us achieve uh, our students to be utterly um, wonderful in the way they, they, they work in the future. And um, I think as we, for example, as we complete our new campus infrastructure in Dubai to create spaces where there are opportunities for new ways of digital interaction, working with physical space and working across our campuses. So I think it's very relevant that you're here today, Sheila, to focus our minds on some of the things around uh, digital education. So um, I look forward to seeing how we can all work together to deliver some of these exciting new opportunities across the university. And um, I think outside of these meetings, I get really excited when people come and tell me what's working really well for them. And we should be proud of that. And I would encourage you to do that. If things that have worked well for you, don't hold back from talking about it with other colleagues. Please don't hold, talk, hold back from talking about it with me. We're really interested in those things, and those are things we really need to focus on so that we can spread that good practice, that excitement, and that positivity that we all have and want <coughs> to do. So, um, Sheila, as you can see, um, we're well disposed to be inspired uh, by, the, by the lecture and the topic today. And may I hand over to uh, Martha to introduce you as our director of the Many, many thanks uh, to you, Richard, uh, for, for joining us today and for, for um, giving us such a warm welcome to the new semester. We wish you a very happy and healthy new year as well. And good afternoon and happy new year to all of you. Um, it's I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to today's inaugural, and we hope there will be many more, inspiring learning new year lecture um, and to be chairing this session. It's a session to help us start the new year with fresh ideas. It's there here to, to help us reflect on how we approach learning and teaching institutionally and individually. And we're hoping that the session will also inspire us to try new things, to explore new opportunities in our teaching practice. And if we're honest, it's also a chance for us just to get together before the hustle and bustle of the semester begins. And on that note, we'll be having a reception afterwards. So if you can stay around and have an informal conversation um, after the session, then you'd be more than welcome to join us for that. First, a little bit of the inevitable housekeeping. Uh, there are no fire alarms planned, despite the beeping in the foyer. Um, so please do exit swiftly if the alarms go off properly. If you're on Twitter, I do join the conversation using the LTA resolutions hashtag. And if you have caring commitments, I know a few people contact me say caring commitments. If you do need to leave, please do. Don't be, don't be worried about standing up and leaving when you have to go. Uh, and do be ready for audience participation. Um, have your mobile devices ready, but please put them on silent. Uh, there will be audience participation, you have been warned. <coughs> so today's session is themed around keeping and uh, setting and keeping our learning and teaching in, uh, resolutions. So I want to take just a very brief moment to reflect back on 2019 and the launch of the Learning and Teaching Academy and flag some of the things that you can look forward to in 2020. So the LTA was launched in autumn of last year and is, um, establishes a focal point for our university learning and teaching community. 
We offer a range of <coughs> programmes, resources and events to help support um, support you in your practice, whatever stage you're at in your career, whether you're brand new to teaching or you're looking to, to develop you and, and support you in your skills and the leadership of learning and teaching. Our prospectus and our resources and the and activities that are coming up are all on our website, so please do. I won't labour the point here, but please do take a look at the website um, and get in touch with us and let us know where um, things that you'd like to get involved with and, and help support building our community. Um, I'd particularly like to flag the What Works Guides to Learning and Teaching um, and the associated video resources that are there. They've been incredibly well received to date, and so please do make use of those. Um, there's, the series so far has focused on assessment and feedback, and we'll have a new series on digital education, which will launch later this month. So please do keep your eyes, out for, uh, eyes open for that and let us know if there are other topics that you'd like to see covered. So please get involved, help us shape the LTA. Um, we'll ho we hope you find a, a really inspiring and engaging community. Now, one of our key objectives uh, at the LTA is to provide a focus for our global uh, learning and teaching activity and our, and our commitment to inspiring learning. So today's event is a really key opportunity to do just that. We're delighted to welcome colleagues. We were delighted this morning to welcome colleagues from across all of our campuses to a rather early for us uh, webinar at seven o'clock this morning. I would, you know, those colleagues from Orkney and uh, Borders campus who joined us, I think deserve <laughs> a, a medal for, for joining us at that time. Um, and we're really delighted that we've got the chance that Sheila's come to, to speak to us in face-to-face -face context here to continue that conversation. So Sheila, I'm thrilled that you are joining us um, and helping us shape not just our conversation today, but over the next, next semester and beyond around, around digital education. Sheila is, uh, brings to this discussion a wealth of experience and insight into digital education and the landscape of university teaching. She's chair of the Association of Learning Technology. She's a prolific researcher, blogger, and writer. And her book on conceptualizing the digital university was one of the must reads of 2019. Those of you that haven't yet read it, it's still available in 2020. So I thoroughly recommend it to you. So thank you so much for joining us, Sheila. We really look forward to you sharing how we can make and keep our digital resolutions. Over to you. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And yeah, I think we are still allowed to say Happy New Year, aren't we? So thank you all very much for coming. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to Martha for that lovely introduction and for Richard for your introduction as, as well. Just to um, explain, I haven't actually been here since seven o'clock this morning. I was able to do that webinar this morning from my home in Glasgow, so I only had to go downstairs, so it wasn't too much of a commute this morning. But it was really nice to be able to speak to international colleagues this morning as well, and we'll share some of the feedback as we go through the presentation uh, today. Um, so uh, let's get going. So the new year 2020, a uh, good time for New Year's resolutions. Um, and just want to, uh, before we start, um, just maybe you could say to each other, have any of you actually made any New Year's resolutions? Any, anybody? Um, you can maybe share. Any of you made any New Year's resolutions around about your learning and teaching? You might want to share that, maybe? No? Or are you, are you just waiting for today for that to happen? Okay, and maybe if you had made some other resolutions, you know, we're kind of in, it's Wednesday, it's day three, you're kind of like, oh my God, it's all starting, it's all kicking off, I actually am going to have to have that cup of coffee and that chocolate biscuit, that's kind of where I am at that point. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting about um, uh, resolutions, I'll talk a bit about, about that, but um, before we start getting into that, I really want to maybe take a bit of time to think about titles and the title of, of, of this talk. Um, and because I find titles um, really fascinating and language in general is always fascinating but it's quite um, <coughs> yeah it's quite difficult to get a title I don't know when you're, you're actually having to make a, a decide on a title for anything it always seems to take the longest time it's really important to get the the tone right um, and I think because that sets the tone and helps us think about the narrative that you're going to to have um, following that um, so today I want to maybe take a bit of time and some 
kind of uh, unpack some narratives around about digital education, about learning and teaching um, uh, with you uh, as we look at our, res uh, as our, res as our resolutions um, as well. Um, so when we were talking about the title for this slide, we had some ideas about New Year's resolution, but um, I had come up with a title and it was something like how to make, share, collaborate, innovate. Well, it's basically a paragraph long. It's a bit long. And Rosemary very tactfully like, oh, it's maybe a bit long. Why don't we just stick with that? And I think that's, that, that's absolutely fine. But again, as I say, what I want to do is I want to kind of look at that a bit more as, as we go, go through it. Um, so yeah, New Year's resolutions um, are quite interesting um, as well. Um, and I was thinking, because there was an international element to the, the talk this morning, I was thinking, well, are they, are, are they actually culturally relevant across the globe? And I think they are pretty much kind of, you know, there is a, a notion of, of doing something at a set, you know, a set point of time that is pretty universal. And in fact, they go back to Babylonian times, um, apparently. Um, but they are, as I was saying here, just there, um, they're quite difficult to keep, aren't they? And I, I was looking for some research around that. Um, and there was a study done by the University of Bristol a couple of years ago, and apparently 88% of people failed to keep their, their New Year's resolutions, which is quite interesting and quite scary at, at, at the same time. So I think we, um, we all want to make a change, but sometimes we find it quite difficult to do that. Um, so... I think that the reason that we find New Year's resolutions difficult to keep is sometimes we, um, we kind of maybe, it's a question of scale. Now, I don't know if you're going to get this, but um, this is the, the, the best kind of copyright free uh, image I could get of Father Ted. I love Father Ted. <laughs> you know that bit where Dougal's kind of, ex uh, Ted is explaining to Dougal about perspective and small and far away. <laughs> I think there's kind of the inverse with New Year's re resolutions that sometimes we're kind of thinking of big, big changes instead of maybe some of the smaller changes that are maybe a bit more um, manageable for us. Um, so I think it's a question of how we, well, like most things in life, it's like finding that balance um, and how we can um, balance those small changes with some of the big ideas and strategies and things that are happening ar around about, uh, about us. Um, and that can be quite a, a trick to do. And again, hopefully today we can start thinking a bit about that as, as well. So going back to titles and narratives, I think it, it's really important, as Richard was saying, that we start to share some of the smaller things as well as the bigger things that, that we're, we're doing. And today, again, is a chance to do that. And I think in terms of change and when we're thinking about change and if we're thinking about big changes across institutions, I'm sure there's maybe a few of you here who have lived through quite a few cycles of change. And you've maybe found that actually in terms of your own practice, some things haven't changed that much. Maybe that hasn't happened, but you know, I think sometimes we've all been in that. And what happens is we tend to stick to our trusted habit, habits the things that we know work um, because we're pragmatic and we want to do that. Um, but I think there are some small changes that we can, we, can, we can do together and we can maybe today start to think about how we can extend our habits and our thoughts around digital education. So what I'm going to be doing um, for the rest of this lecture is I'm going to be taking you on talking about some big concepts, some big narratives, some big stories, and then we'll come back to you know some of the maybe smaller, but by no means any less important issues around about practice and how we can maybe start to think about some uh, resolutions and habits that we're actually going to stick to this, this year. So to start, um, I want to talk about something big. I want to talk about this word digital and what it, what it means. So this is the first bit of audience participation. So hopefully you'll have your um, internet enabled uh, devices there. Um, Digital first, I think, is a, a phrase that's been used a lot. So when I say digital first, if you could go to menti.com and put in that code, um, I want you to share the first three words that come to mind. Don't think too much about this. And as soon as some responses come in, um, we'll start seeing them on, sc on screen. Hopefully we've all got an internet connection and the Wi-Fi hasn't gone down at this point. We had some quite interesting responses this morning as well in, in um, the webinar. 
And if, if there's nothing coming to your mind, then that's quite telling in itself as well. Oh, right, okay. Convenient, easy, modern. Yeah, nice. Ah. Workload, yes. Yeah, accessible, accessibility, yeah. Quick, connectedness. Distance covered. Oh, that's an interesting one. Actually, I think stand here was a sense. Data and analytics, yes. Cold. Hmm, interesting. Automated. Passive. Ooh. Interesting. Inequality, that's an interesting one that's coming up now as well. Future, flexible, complexity. International, yeah. Hopefully we'll be covering some of this. Online, universal. Hmm. Yeah, I always think it's fascinating just watching these word clouds de uh, develop. Obviously, the, um, the more common words that are bigger. Oh, right, that's really, really, really interesting set of results. I will share these slides later and I'll put a copy of this on so you can have a look. That's really, but we, oh gosh, 70, 73? Do you think we can get 75 and then we'll say, oh, wow. Fantastic. Right. 80, wow, fantastic. 81, wow. Uh, less interactive, efficient, oh, okay. Right, off button, I like that as well coming through. Yeah, well, we could probably go. So obviously that means quite a lot to people. Um, and if I just go back to, we can keep going through this, but um, I'll just share with you um, what your colleagues in Malaysia uh, that was the, the word cloud we got today from, obviously it was a smaller uh, group of people. So there are some, some similar similarities there as well. Um, future, global, internet, online. Um, yeah, so interesting. Food for thought there as well, but it's definitely food for thought. But in terms of digital and that word digital, I find that um, quite a troublesome word um, in terms of what does it actually mean? So we have that sort of dictionary definition of binary code and zeros and ones, but I think it's used in lots of different ways uh, just now. Um, it's used quite often as a verb and a noun. Um, and I think it's political, both with a small p and a capital P. I think it's often divisive um, and it's highly contextual, um, particularly in relation to education. So um, this is a quote um, from... Uh, a report that McKinsey uh, released last year. Um, and I just want you to take a couple of minutes to look at that. And they're saying that they believe digital should be seen less as a thing and more of a way of doing things. That's that noun verb thing. And helpfully, to make this clearer, they've broken this, this down into three attributes. It's about creating value at the new frontiers of the business world. It's about creating value in the processes that execute a vision of customer experiences and building foundational capabilities that support the entire structure. Now, I don't know about you, but I have no idea what that actually means. <laughs> but it sounds good, doesn't it? You know, it's about value, um, the frontiers of the business world, foundational capabilities. That kind of narrative I find quite worrying. Um, particularly in relation to um, education. But it's the kind of language and the kind of narrative that's really powerful and quite political. And you could see a lot of people really, really liking that. And I think we have to be careful of that, particularly that notion of customers in relation to higher education, because I don't think the experience that you get when you're doing an undergraduate or postgraduate degree is the same um, or can be treated the same as you know some other consumer processes um, and I think supporting the entire structure in a, an education context is, is quite a different thing. So I think we have to be wary of these kind of um, definitions and we really need to think about digital in our own context. Um, and of course the context I want to look about, uh, think about today is in terms of um, learning and teaching. So I want to look 
at your learning um, and teaching strategy. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with the, this diagram, the learning and teaching strategy. It's all about inspiring learning. We've got Harriet Watts students, graduates <coughs> at the very uh, centre, and curriculum, teaching and assessment are the enablers around about it. Um, and it's been interesting for me to look at your learning and teaching strategy in the last couple of weeks in preparation for this. Um, and again, when we look at the, again, apologies, you, you're probably very familiar with this, but I don't think it does any harm just to refresh our, our, our memories in relation to learning and teaching strategy. And I know it's relatively new, this um, uh, strategy as well. So the vision, um, I've added some emphasis here as well. Okay, uh, it's just been designed to encamp encapsulate your aspirations um, and strategic de developments and, and to provide a strategic and, and enriching learning ex experience. And um, in particular, to develop critical learning to learn capabilities. And the focus is, as I said, around about your students. They'll be the focal and the uh, focal and the end point of the strategy. And your priorities, as we saw in the diagram, around curriculum, teaching, and assessment. Um, and these are aspirational. I think they're achievable. I think you're probably already. In fact, I know you're already doing a lot of, of good work around of that. Um, I've added, as I said, the emphasis, but I thought of what I would um, look at today is maybe to explore some of the themes that are coming out of that strategy and look at them and maybe think a bit more about some of the areas, um, particularly the, the criticality around critical learning and um, the role of the student and how we can maybe start to rethink about some notions of curriculum and teaching and assessment practice um, and how we can think about um, maybe refocusing what we want to do in terms of um, developing uh, our approaches to creating digitally enabled, inspiring learning. So obviously a big theme here in, at Harriet Watt is around the global. And again, these are things I've just picked out of, of the strategy. You have a global um, uh, footprint. You know, I was this morning, we were talking to colleagues in Malaysia, in, in Dubai, as well as in other parts of Scotland. Um, and the global is going to be an is going to be and is part of your uh, learning and teaching. Um, we've got notions of global team teachings. Um, and students are going to be able to combine modes and locations of studies. Um, you're going to have um, engaged learning communities and the technology will help this to be um, delivered and, and be seamless and, and integrated. Um, so I think again there's quite a lot in that and what, what struck me as I was looking at that is that actually um, that's really quite challenging in terms of, of teaching practice. And um, There was some sharing er earlier this morning in terms of how you do that. Um, but I just wanted, to, it raised some questions for me that I just wanted to share with you as well. So, you know, how do global teaching teams actually work? You know, how do we make them work? Um, how do they evolve? How do we share our practice across different campuses? Obviously, we have some global presence, but we're not in the, the whole of the world. So how are we thinking about extending to different parts of the world as well? Um, you know, how do we overcome the challenges of different geographical and digital spaces? Um, the challenges of working within different cultures um, and the different cultural norms around learning and teaching and, and, and pedagogy. So some of the perhaps more progressive pedagogical approaches that we might think are quite normal practice here in Scotland might not be um, so much for other parts of the world. So. Um, how do we do that? How do, how do we develop that? How do we take those cultural norms into consideration in terms of our curriculum? And, you know, and I think we need to think, are our curriculums truly global? Or are they actually maybe just digitally mediated educational con uh, colonization? Um, I think we have to think about that. Um, how many different languages and cultures are we are really represented in our curriculum? Um, and I think obviously while technology is allowing more seamless um, access and integration to things, we had a very successful <coughs> webinar this morning which is an example of that. Um, in terms of developing engaged um, and, and vibrant learning uh, communities, are we actually creating truly equitable spaces? I hope we are, but I think there's a lot around that that we, we need to um, think about. 
For example, does English always have to be the dominant language? You know, I was very aware, and I'm always aware when I'm speaking at international events, that I have the privilege of being able to speak in, in English and other people understand what I'm saying. Um, but does that need to happen there? But with all these things going on and thinking about global, teaching globally and, and creating these communities, um, I think that does redefine what we do and, and how we do things um, in terms of this kind of more digitally enabled wor world. And I think in context of that, that means that we have to think a bit more about our notions of well-being and, and of, of care and how we care for different, cultural, uh, different cultures um, in our new kind of globally connected context. So that brings me on to the, the next uh, theme around about well-being, which again is highlighted in the learning and teaching strategy, which is really positive to see. And I think that's again partly a reflection of some of the, the things that are happening in wider in society, particularly around mental health and student mental health and, and you recognising the, the issues that are there. Um, but also staff well-being is absolutely critical to student well-being as well. Um, um, we you know, need to think about how we balance the, the, the needs to provide different forms of student care with the, the, the pressures we're putting on staff to do that and making sure that we have enough staff in place to do that. I don't think technology can really mediate a lot of those things, though it can, but there are different pressures, again, around about digital technology that can come to bear on staff as well that bring a whole new set of pressure, that kind of always-on culture. I think that was uh, mentioned in Dubai in the Mentimeter, that 24-7 thing. Um, so I think we need to think about digital well-being. Um, and I think that's fundamentally not just digital well-being. I think that's human well-being. It's a general well-being. Um, so going back to another, de this is a definition that I like. Um, this is a definition of, of digital well-being from JISC that they released um, late last year. And I like this, and again, I've, I've added some emphasis uh, here. So it's the impact of technology and services on mental, physical, and social and emotional health. And they're saying it's a complex pr a concept, which it is, and it's very context uh, dependent. Um, and I think it's quite difficult to separate out digital well-being from, from di uh, general well-being. But it can be quite useful to think about some of the different elements that are involved there. So JISC have started to do that. They have uh, four elements that, that they focus on. So there's digital social well-being, personal well-being, learning well-being, and work well-being. Now, again, I think it's much more fuzzy in reality. I don't think it's kind of straight there, there's an awful lot of inter, um, interlinking and over, overlapping. I don't think you can really separate out social well-being from personal well-being. Though I think there's a lot that we can do within the whole of the educational context from you know, <coughs> preschool through to postgraduate around about ensuring that all of us, staff and students alike, actually realise what we're doing with per personal informa information when we're interacting with digital systems. You know, who share, who's who are we giving our data to? Who can see things? Again, particularly for students who are using different services, they might not realize that potentially employers can see all their photographs. Um, so we need to think about that. And there's kind of, uh, we, we obviously have GDPR as well, which is going some way to address some of these personal information um, issues. But it's not the answer to everything. So just saying we're, we're GDR compliant is not really kind of good enough. Um, but also, I think at an institutional level, we need to be increasingly transparent about the data that we are <coughs> collecting and sharing about our students and about us, about, about staff as well. And think about how much data um, some of the systems that we use every day hold about our, us and our students. So a classic example of that is Turnitin. You know, it has a huge amount of information about students, their, their attainment, what they're doing, that students don't get, in fact, we don't get either. I'm not going to go into that too much, but there's lots of systems that we use. So I think when we're thinking about our infrastructure, we really need to be having serious discussions with these companies about data and how we can access that. Um, but of course, thinking about that does take time. Um, and this is the next theme I want to talk about um, and take quite a bit of time to talk about time. So I think I find with, with time and, and strategy development, we don't really talk about time. We talk about timelines, which are slightly different. Um, 
Um, and looking at these areas, you know, well-being, technology, space and facilities and changing institutional cu uh, culture, to me, they just scream out time. You really need time to engage with all of these things. Um, and particularly if you want to fulfill all the aspirations of, of a, a, a strategy. Um, and I think just now in the wider context, time is increasingly a kind of a precious thing. <laughs> but there seems to be less and less time for people to do things. And also, if we look back to just before Christmas, you know, there was quite a major strike by a lot of staff. You know, people were out on strike for eight days. That's a lot of time, it's a lot of time to catch up. And I know there, there, there were many issues around about that, you know, in terms of, you know, workload pressures, pensions, all precarities of, of contacts. But I think we have to be aware of those pressures and we, we are asking staff to do a lot more. Um, and that, again, going back to well-being, it's very precious. There's always more to be done. So whilst it's great that we're having investment in new learning spaces and technologies and, and facilities, we really need to ensure that we're making time for staff to engage in those spaces, um, to um, explore, to experiment, to play and learn in these spaces as well. Um, and when we're evaluating these spaces, that we're actually thinking about actual practice and learning as, as we're using them. Um, so we don't actually just end up stuffing places, or, you know, new spaces with lots of shiny kit that actually won't get used because you might not have had the time to actually think about how things work properly. Um, and some really practical issues. Um, so, for example, if you have... You know, um, I'm sure you probably do have spaces like this on this campus. You know, if you've got more kind of active learning spaces where you've got group tables with shared um, screens at the end of them, everyone's tapping into a device. You've maybe got 50 or 60 students in the room. You're maybe connecting when you're active, um, you're uh, engaged learning community globally. You might have another 50 or 60 students all over the globe. That's quite, and if you're doing collaborative learning, that can be quite a noisy space. So you maybe don't want to have any more students in there. Yes, you can have a microphone, but you don't want to maybe be shouting all the time. So you have to learn and you have to develop how you facilitate effective learning in, in these spaces as well. And that can take time. Getting connected up to some of these devices can take time as well. So um, I think we've all been there. If you've ever, I think we've all been in that situation where you, you've planned something and you go in and the technology doesn't work. That still happens. That is the most stressful thing that can happen, I think, when you're teaching, isn't it? So and when that happens, you revert back to what you know. So sometimes you just do what you're comfortable with. Um, because that is you looking after your own well-being because you can control that situation. So if we want people to extend and change their habits. We have to give people to time to explore and to experiment. Um, and if we want to change culture, then time to do that, to create stories and share that with everybody is really, really important. So we can't create more time. I wish we could, but we can. That would probably be everyone's New Year resolution, wouldn't it? Um, but I think we can maybe think about how we use our time a bit more effectively and think about some of the things that we do and we have to do and incorporate some other elements within that. So I think for me, one of the things that we, the most best use of our time is actually think, taking time to think about learning or teaching design, actually how we plan the activities that we're going to deliver and the programmes and the modules we're delivering to our students. So, for example, I think you've got some programme approval and reapproval events coming up in the, the next year. So when we have these kind of times set aside that we have to do certain things, let's make sure that we're actually thinking as much about what we're, how we're actually going to teach um, as we are in getting the quality documentation together. And I'm not knocking, and we obviously need uh, quality documentation as well, but going back to that kind of shared language, we need to ensure that actually there isn't that kind of gulf between what we say we're going to do in a module descriptor and what actually happens in the classroom, whether that's online or face-to-face. Or -face. So we need to have you know, common narratives, shared languages around how we're using digital education and technologies that are meaningful, <coughs> that are relevant and are consistent across the university. So I think we need to do that. And again, you're moving to a new VLE later this year. So that's a really good opportunity to start thinking about what you actually do and not thinking just about, well, what buttons do I press and how do I upload? Actually think about how you could use that to stimulate and enrich 
your teaching as well and the learning ex experience. So how could that VLE be, you know, the, really a key hub for your global learning and teaching communities and, and creating inspiring learning? Think about how is your teaching presence represented within your module in the VLE? You know, what could you do? Do you have a video or a, an audio of, of, of yourself, you know? Because if you don't have a presence in that, that space, then why should your students bother going and looking there? Think about how the kind of um, way you're presenting some of your course materials. Does it all have to be a Word document? Maybe you want to use a bit more video. If you can use Microsoft Sway, you could maybe start putting some videos together, collecting things. Lots of things you can do. So it's the kind of thinking a bit more laterally about when we're doing things, going back to what we actually want to do. And little things can make huge differences to actually that notion of inspiring learning. But also, again, this, this needs time, but we need to, if we do want to have students who are developing these critical learning to learn skills, um, we need to think, we need to have the time to think about criticality ourselves and look at things in a much more critical way as well. But um, again, if we want to change our, our approaches to teaching and, and curriculum and assessment, we need to be creating a culture where we're, we're um, empowering people to be constructively critical of everything that we're doing, um, including digital education and digital technologies. And this kind of leads me to, on to some of the work that I've been doing around this, this very thing. Um, and with some colleagues, Martha mentioned the book, thanks for that plug, that was great. Um, <laughs> Colleagues, uh, Bill Johnson, who I used to work with at the University of Strathclyde, and Keith Smythe, who's the Professor of Pedagogy at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, we spent the last couple of years thinking about how you could recenter conversations around about um, the digital um, and think about digital developments in, in, in a slightly different way. And we were thinking more of kind of the notion of a, a digital university. Um, and we think that that's actually what we, we call a kind of a very much a discursive co a construct in that a digital university has has many meanings but um not a, a one agreed definition um and there needs to be a way to kind of focus discussion around what that actually means in context so one of the things we did and this was way back in 2012 um when bill and i started doing this work i'm not going to spend too much time on this um we were looking at um how a different view of what a university could be that was suitable for a digital age were again kind of influenced by people like Stefan Kalini kind of questions what a, a digital you know what a university is for in, in this in this age so we looked at participation which obviously is, is key to what we're doing and back then um, there was a word called globalization and that was that kind of merging of the local and the and the global I think probably globalization is is more the, the word of de jure, if you like. We also wanted to have a look at um, the civic responsibility of a, a university in, in a digital age and how that changed at all, looking at different nets, uh, networks and some of the technological affordances that, that could bring. We very much took an information literacy lens um, when we're looking at that, and we feel that digital literacy is a subset of information li literacy. So we're looking at, at those issues. Looking at learning environments, not just in terms of a VLE, but the physical learning environment like we're, we're here, but also looking to the work of people like Vermont in terms of students and individuals as their own learning environments as well. And we're looking at curriculum and course design, um, things like constructive alignment, curriculum representations, you know, reporting data and analytics, um, learning analytics was just bubbling up back then. Um, so we used this, um, we used this with Keith um, when he was at Napier at, um, developing their, their new digital strategy. I used this uh, at GCU when I was working there as well. And so we got quite a lot of engagement and buy-in, but we did realise that we needed to have a, a stronger theoretical um, framework for this as well. So that's really what the book uh, looks at. So we've come up with this sort of 3D version of it. So we're really thinking about how we could maybe use this to think about organisational development in a different way and actually putting curriculum and academic, uh, academic development at the heart of organisational change. Um, so we've introduced notions of open educational practice, mainly because that's 
for our, our own practice, uh, we're very much open educational practitioners. Um, we've also, our main theoretical um, framework was uh, critical pedagogy. So we looked to the work of Paolo Freire in, in particular, and not so much pedagogy of the oppressed, but uh, education for critical consciousness. And that was really interesting looking at that just now. You know, he in that book, he was talking about this transition from Brazil in the late 1960s from an agrarian to a, an industrial society. I think there's quite a strong resonance with what's happening in terms of uh, moving to kind of a, a digital economy in the 21st century and thinking about, um, you know, the digital giants, you know, face, digital global Facebook, uh, uh, digital global giants like Facebook and Amazon and Google and the, the impact that they have on everything in, in our society. Um, and obviously, we, want, we wanted to also include notions of praxis. Um, and what Freire uh, describes that is as a co building collective understandings derived from cycles of dialogic and experiential learning and a commitment to challenging and changing that which needs to be challenged and changed. And I think that's fundamental to education. That's what education is about, particularly higher education. It's about challenging and changing things. Um, so again, looking to people like Giroux and, 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 and thinking about, we want to do this to create kind of a language of hope, if you like, you know, so you positive criticality um, and actually explore some of the, the relationships that are happening in our universities externally as well, so that we're really preparing our students to make a big difference and, and to transform societies. Um, we think this matrix could be a, a, a way to um, look at the university in a, in a slightly different a different way and, and, and think about our own lived reality and, and how our institu institutional reality is is represented in, in, in strategy and, and development. Um, and it was great, Richard, earlier on, you mentioned about the, the great work that's happening in the, the university and how you want to know about that and, and people should share that. Because quite often, I think, what we, we tend to do is we forget to co consolidate what already works and we, we get something new, whether that's a new system or what, whatever. And I, I certainly have been uh, in situations where I think I, I'm living through some kind of institutional amnesia, where it's like, did we not do that a few years ago? We're just calling it something different now. So I think we need to have some consolidation around um, things that we're doing as well. So I'm going to race through some things because we've not got some a huge amount of time left. So these are the kind of things that we're wanting to do. We want to have a critically engaged academic academic development and look at kind of the fluidity between between different roles now, um, between teachers, between academic developers, learning technologists, uh, etc. Um, but one of the things we have looked at quite a lot is the notion of the curriculum. Um, and we want to kind of think about the curriculum as, um, I think a lot of people think it's quite an uncontested space, that it's, we're quite co comfortable, you know, curriculum is a way that we kind of instantiate what we do in a university, it's how we um, deliver our programmes of study, how we organise things. But we think that it, it could be contested and we could have a different view of that. So the way we've done this is, um, what we've co called in this diagram, which I realise is quite complex, is the digitally di distributed um, curriculum. Um, and we've got um, some values enabling dimensions. Obviously, this is quite a busy diagram, probably needs a keynote of, it, of its own. So we're thinking about notions of praxis, participation and public pedagogy, thinking about co-location and co-production, um, about openness, about that porosity, about how things leak out of a university. Um, and we have the enabling dimensions and then we have in three we have the, the instantiation. Now we want this to be challenged and changed and perhaps one thing you could do here at Harriet Watt is maybe in relation to your learning and teaching strategy you could have curriculum teaching and assessment there and, and look at that. So if we are wanting to think about how, how we change things and, and develop more criticality we think about actually that kind of the third part, the instantiation of co-location and co-production. How are we using our spaces? What are we asking our students to do? Um, in terms of, say, endpoint assessments, do they always have to be in closed institutional systems? I know you're kind of moving to some more portfolio-based uh, approaches just now, but how about, you know, how do we develop um, students' sense of agency? Because that's what they need to have to be, to be critical. And could thinking about maybe releasing things in, in a more open way, maybe getting students to tell some digital stories 
you know, to use technology, to use more multimedia artifacts. Um, that might be a way for them to share outside the university as well, because we know that it's really empowering for all of us, but for our students, if you have something that then you can take to an employer to share with the rest of the world, that can be really empowering. And again, in terms of digital artifacts, um, you know, if you're being expected to create digital artifacts as well, just thinking about how, um, how you could represent some of the things that, that you have and also sharing them more openly, but also thinking about how you can do some co-production with students. You don't actually have to do everything yourself, you know, going back to your course design, thinking about what it is you're actually asking your students to do. They can do a lot of things. You know, you do obviously have to think about you know, setting some, some boundaries within that. But we think there's some ways that you could um, maybe take this um, diagram and start thinking about things. So just going back, I mean, that's me gone quite big, and that hopefully doing that, you could start thinking about curriculum as more unbounded, as a bit more open, maybe more equitable, um, and more critically informed. But how do we do that? So let's come back down to some of the things that we want to do that. So how do we really create this kind of digital first reality? Well, I think we have to be, remember this, I think it's about people. You know, everything we do is just digitally enabled. It's about putting people first. So we need to give people the time to do things, um, to share things, to care for each other, just to check in and, and say to people, like, what were you doing this week? You know, I know we, we kind of do that, but we quite often we're so busy um, that we don't actually ask people what they're doing. So take a bit of time, that could be a new, a good resolution. Let's just take a bit of time and share how things are going. Um, what's working? Be a bit more critical about what we're doing in terms of positive criticality, you know, what's working, what's not working, share that. Um, come along to some of the, the events that are being run by the, the Learning and Teaching Academy. Um, and the more kind of digital enabled approaches we take, the more that we look and start using digital education approaches, then the more we have to do things together anyway, it becomes much more a team approach. And if we are going to be having these global teams, we need to de be developing that. So, um, you know, we need to care for each other and start sharing uh, things. I think in terms of doing things uh, as, um, that are inspirational, I, I was reflecting on this. I don't think I've ever done anything that I have thought is particularly inspirational, but I have learned a lot from other people and I've been inspired a lot by other people online at conferences and various things. And I've taken bits of what they've done and I've kind of adapted them for my uh, context. I think the most powerful thing that I've ever done is I've shared that back. And I know that I have got a lot out of doing that. So I think sharing is one of the things we can do. So actually just sharing a little bit of what you're, you're doing can make a huge in, um, impact. So I've been inspired hugely by other people. So I, I want to finish this off. I want you to inspire me. So I um, want to, uh, if you could just maybe take a couple of minutes and you might want to think about this uh, before you do it and take, you might want to have a little chat to, to, to think about this. But maybe just share one thing that you're maybe going to commit to this year, whether it's coming along to one event here, actually looking again at the What Works guides. I've used them and they're, they're, they're very, very good. Um, I've talked a lot about open education. If you don't know what that is, maybe take commit to finding out a bit more about it. There's Open Education Week coming up in the 2nd to the 6th of March. There's an Open Scotland blog for it's sharing a lot of practice things that are happening in, uh, in Scotland. Um, not sure about digital learning. Again, uh, I was reminded of the Christmas holidays of a great book that Frank Rennie and Keith Smith wrote called Digital Learning, the Key Concepts. Quite a good book to look at, see if that's in the library. Um, maybe just committing to, to one thing, maybe trying one thing, maybe representing something, a Word document <coughs> in, in, in SWE or using some more video, but maybe share one thing. We did that with colleagues um, uh, in Dubai and Malaysia, so there's already some great ideas. I think obviously you had uh, uh, Phil Race and Sally <coughs> Brown here uh, late last year. Obviously, there's a lot about assessment and feedback, thinking about peer assessment. If you're doing any peer assessment, you might want to share that. So a lot of things you could do, but let's start sharing.